Well, welcome back, everybody. You know, every week I'm having a call with someone who is contemplating, who's on the verge of, or are recently retired. Most are struggling, honestly, having been so heads down doing the work, but failing to properly and intentionally prepare themselves for this next chapter. So whether you're three months away, three years away, or 13 years away from hanging up your operational day job, this episode is going to help you chart the course for what is referred to as chapter two, or what my guests will talk about as the great pivot. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to shine the light on two of the best of the best CIOs, CXOs ever to hold those titles. And they are shining stars when it comes to threading the chapter two needle. Diana McKenzie held many roles at Eli Lilly. She was the CIO at Amgen, which many of us know about her journey there. And then she was Workday's first CIO. Karen Ann Terrell was an executive at big brand companies, Baxter, Walmart, and GSK. So we're gonna unpack both their stories today, uh, their learnings uh, along this journey, uh, both in their operational careers and also in this chapter as well. So Karen Ann, I wanna start with you. So welcome to the podcast and thank you for being here. Let's start with the what. Can you bring us up to date on what chapter two looks like for you? And maybe more broadly, what are some of the other career paths people might be considering as they contemplate the great pivot? Well, Dan, from the beginning, I called it CAT 2.0. Um, I uh, knew this time that I was going to be post-operating career and that I would find the fortitude to actually construct um, a life. I don't like the term plural life, but um, because I just think of it as a portfolio of things uh, that I do. And in CAT 2.0, uh, I cut my world into one third purposefully. One third was going to be boards, public and private. Advisory boards, which is a new and emerging area for especially technologists that work amongst groups of advisory boards, but not as a fiduciary board. And as a senior advisor for a portfolio company, um, the, the greatest scale up company in the world, I think, is Insight Partners. And I'm a senior advisor uh, with them. So that's my one third. I do one third uh, lifting women and people of color into significant positions of power and influence in the technology realm. Uh, I don't work at the bottom of the funnel. I don't work in the middle. I, I, I like to work at the top and trying to get people into the most influential jobs. And then I said that I was going to give one third of time to my husband of 40 years. Uh, he uh, was a bit of an overshoot. He was getting about 1% previously. So 33% is not necessary. But uh, that's the way I kind of chopped up my life in CAT 2.0. I love it. I love it. And uh, hopefully you're having a great time in this chapter with, uh, with those third. And sometimes it can be a fourth third. I'm sure there's other things that come up. And, you know, for you, Diana, what's your, what's your new chapter look like? You've been thriving as well as Karen Ann. And what are you doing? But also, what do you see others doing in this chapter? Yeah, so um, I got started a few years before Karen Ann, so I wish that I would have thought about Diana 2.0, but I was just trying to figure it all out at the time. Um, but I love the chapter. I love how chapter two is being written. Um, I spend, I would say, about a third on the same things Karen Ann does. I serve on a number of uh, for-profit boards. I also advise for private equity, not the number one, but top 25 uh, growth base uh, um, investment firm. And I do a lot of advising of startup companies, primarily with a focus in healthcare and healthcare technology. And I invest in a number of these companies as well. The, the second part of that is the philanthropic and giving back. So one of the boards I serve on, as we all know, is T200, uh, wonderful not-for-profit that's all about lifting women in technology. But I also give a tremendous amount of time to others that we're trying to lift across a broad swath, men, women, um, just, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Just if they're interested in trying to solve a problem someplace along the lines, in a C-suite role, digital transformation, et cetera. I, I give my time for free mentoring, spend a lot of time doing that. 
And the last third, just like Karen Ann, um, trying to be a good wife to my husband, who's fully retired. And I also have three beautiful grandchildren and one on the way. And what I try to tell everybody who's now approaching this phase of their life is if you think you'll have grandchildren, you must save a board seat time-wise to make sure you're spending the amount of time with them that you'll want to that you'll want to spend with them. Yeah, what's the, uh, I've got grandkids too. And what is it? If I knew it was that good, I would have done it first, right? That's just how cool that is. <laughs> Amen. You shared that with me a couple of weeks ago and I've been telling, I've been sharing that with everybody else. It's a great saying. So good, so good. You know, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the philanthropic work, the give back. You know, I, I usually do this later in the, in the program, but, you know, we we do that. We call it Tech for Good here on the podcast. And we've committed $150,000 a year in scholarships to our Tech Alex Leadership Program. And so together, you have the ability to gift a seat in that program to one of your favorite STEM uh, nonprofits. So you all, you both do so much, but is there one that you have in common that you'd like to, uh, to gift this to? T200. Hey. All <laughs> Definitely. right. Definitely. All right. Yeah, Dan, we're uh, so grateful for what you've given so far. As a matter of fact, I think one of the programs you gifted to us starts today. Uh, we are kicking um, off. And, uh, you know, what's special about the T200? Many things that, you know, need to need to go look at the website. The work that you all doing there is amazing. T200 is the only organization that's a, now a four-time recipient of this uh, of this scholarship. So that tells you a little something wow. about uh, how the C-suite thanks to this organization. So thank you. I, I know on thank behalf you. of uh, Angela Yocum and the whole board there, uh, they'll be excited about that. And the people that they send to as scholarship recipients are just amazing women. They're, they're just rock stars. So thank you so That's much. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. So, you know, we talked about the what, and, you know, I think we want to talk about the one question. And, you know, so often we see people miss miss the window. Right. And so let's talk about the window. Diana, maybe you can kind of start in terms of how to be intentional. When should we start to get serious about that journey? Yeah, I I, I think for many of us, there, there, there isn't one answer to this question. Um, and I think it's different for everyone. I, I do believe, at least for me anyway, in that second half of what I thought my career was going to be. So if operating was going to be 30 to the 33 years, 35 years, there as you start to approach that first CXO role, I do think we look around us and we say, how long do I want to do this role? Um, and how long do I want to do it for this industry? Um, and in some cases, specifically for me, I was in the same industry for 33 years. And so it, it, if, you know, you just think about this and then you say, well, what, what do I see as a way to make an impact for as long as I can make an impact? And if I think five to 10 years out, what could that impact be? And then what would I have to do? What plan would I have to put together to execute um, in order to be at that place? And again, I get a lot of questions. People say, well, what if I don't know what I wanna do when I grow up? Well, you know, the fact that you're actually thinking about what you wanna be when you grow up is a good place to start. And as you start to formulate that plan, it can often require courage to execute it. That courage could involve taking on a different role within the company you work for. It could involve going to work for a new company and taking on a completely different industry, a different role. It almost always includes networking, extending and cultivating your personal and professional networks. And I've had so many people say to me, I just didn't have time to do that in my job. And my question back to them is, how can you be effective in your job if you're not leveraging a network to, to you know, to broaden your perspective? It's, it's beneficial in the here and now, and it's beneficial in the future. And making those investments takes time. It takes time to pay off. So that's why waiting until you're in your first and thinking that may be your last CXO job to start planning for whatever is going to happen in the second part of your career is probably too late. And you're likely going to find you need more time and you need to put a little bit more work in before you're going to be ready to go do whatever it is you think you want to do when you grow up. Yeah, really good. I want to come back to the networking stuff here in a bit. And, you know, Karen, when 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 did you know it was time for CAT 2.0? Um, and you even talk about maybe a fail early on in that in that journey. 
Well, I always love the Wall Street Journal because they're going to announce what your plans are, whether they're right or not. And uh, when I when I left Walmart, uh, I actually had every intention uh, to retire. I uh, I had no plan. I had no idea what I was going to do. I just had this uh, idea that you know, what do you do after you're the CIO of the biggest company on earth? It was a it was a very um, big feeling of, I guess, that I'm done. And, uh, but I'm done with no plan. Uh, I'm done with no network. I, I'm done. Uh, and I'm going to put my feet up and eat bonbons. I don't know what I thought I was going to do, but um, I, I was retired in March and in London working in a new CIO job in August. And uh, so it was an epic fail. <laughs> It was an epic fail. And and that it, it taught me a little bit about CAT 2.0. Number one, you you have to have some founding principles around which you are gonna do a chapter two. Otherwise, um you you actually are just gonna get sucked into the momentum of uh, um chapter one. And I'm sure Diana can attest uh in the when side of things, even when I went CAT 2.0. Lots of big CIO jobs chased me down, trying to get me to say, you know, yeah, I've got one more in me. And so what was different between the two, um, I had a plan. My guiding principles were interesting people and interesting topics. And I did not want to work for the man, small m. I, did, I wanted, you know, to have a true fool for a boss, Karen and Terrell. And I wanted to, you know, to really do things on uh, on my own terms. And those things stopped me from uh, running after an operating career. I, I think I also found a great deal of energy and joy in constructing the portfolio. That doesn't mean I didn't feel dread and fear because... Every single day, my diary wasn't full and all of that. And, and everyone, that is a very, very natural thing to feel. But I, I felt like I had um, a lot of energy and joy that was pulling me towards the uh, towards the 2.0. And I, I had to get really comfortable with knowing I was not moving away from something because that's, I felt very much in my fail that I was moving away from what had defined me and that I was actually moving towards something that I felt very, very good about. And that's how I knew um, there wasn't going to be one more in me. It doesn't mean that I'm not busy and I, I don't get a bit out over my skis with some of the things I'm doing in 2.0, but it's it's not going to be going back to a big operating career. So that's that. I think those are signs of knowing when to pull the trigger. And I needed a good six months before um, leaving GSK to really understand what I might do um, in the next. I needed it that, that from a planning point of view. I couldn't have done it just at the end because I think I'd have got sucked back into another operating role. You know, Diane, I think that's a good transition to the how, right? I think people want to know how do you do this, right? What was your roadmap? What was your thought process even, you know, in terms of how you how uh, you approach the how? Yeah, it's a, you know, mine was a little different from Karen Ann's. Um, when I was still at Amgen, I was in the CIO role about three years, a couple of things happened. One, I brought Corn Ferry in and asked them to assess all of my direct reports for their readiness to be a CIO as if they were being recruited from the outside because I felt like I was, ineffectual at adding, adding anything more of value to their development plans without that outside-in perspective. And as part of that, I had to agree to go through the assessment myself. So Corn Ferry evaluated whether or not I was capable to be the CIO that I was. And in those conversations, you know, they asked me, what do you want to do next? And I thought, I just don't think I want another big CIO job. Like a bigger and better is not what makes my socks go up and down. So I had to really start thinking about what that was. We were also launching a digital health initiative at Amgen. And for the first time in my life, my team was building software that patients would use, that physicians would use, not software that our company used to operate itself. And I fell in love with that. But I also realized there's an awful lot about building software that's going to be used by people out there 
that I didn't understand because I'd never worked for a software company. The last thing that happened was Betsy Atkins came to see a couple of us who were on the executive team there to talk to us about women on boards and how challenging at that time, this was 2015, it was for a woman to make it onto a public board if you waited until you retired. And the company that I worked for, CEO, was not supportive of any of the executive team members serving on public boards while we were there. So I had to face that hard question of, if I want to be on a board someday, and I'm pretty sure I do, and I want to go help technology and healthcare company startups really get off the ground the right way, I've got to go figure out how to fill in my gaps. And that's when Workday came calling. Um, Workday was a fabulous opportunity to go work for an amazing company at a you know, major growth point in their trajectory, work for an amazing leadership team, and learn how software companies run. I also, when I went to Workday, knowing that this board vision was something that I wanted to do, signed up with Coco Brown, who had just at that point launched the Athena Alliance. It was her first year, not for profit, and you know, gave me the opportunity to do some board prep as she was introducing women in the Bay Area to this, this uh, capability. When I got my first call while I was at Workday with support from the CEO to join a public board, I was more ready than I otherwise would have been because I had taken the steps. And the process went very quickly. Within three months, you know, they offered me a role on the board. Um, and at that point, I, I said, well, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna continue to work until the second board opportunity came, which was a healthcare technology company. Soon to IPO, would have been a public role. I really wanted it, but I couldn't do two public boards and also be the CIO in this company. I'd been there three years. It was time for me to move on and take what I'd learned and apply it in the places that I wanted to apply it when I grew up. So we recruited my successor and that's when I started my portfolio life. You know, embedded in your answer is something that's really interesting. Number one, it's hard to imagine Diana McKenzie with gaps to fill, but we'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Uh, but with that self-awareness, right, to know that, to know what you wanted, what you needed to do to fill those fill those gaps, get that experience, it's amazing. Uh, you know, Karen, I'd, I'd be curious to your, your perspective too, how you approach the how and You've got this ecosystem thinking way of approaching it. Uh, can you talk about that? I do. It's um, I I think the best technologists actually think about the portfolio of how they support and drive technology and innovation in their companies through the mindset of innovation. It used to be about relationships and partnerships, but I think now it has really become. It's a it's a very very diverse. Uh, environment associated with uh, technology. There's big tech, of course, and the way that you think about managing what big tech can bring. There's also the scaling technology companies that are between a hundred million and a billion dollars. They're not big tech companies. They're uh, they're usually very um, individual in the value that they bring. And there's venture capital in all that. So if the world of how you put technology together in your operating career is really defined, um, your influence in your thought leadership is defined by how you think in terms of ecosystems and manage all of them working together. Um, why wouldn't I put a portfolio life together that actually thinks about that same um, ecosystem? I, 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 for years, uh, thought in terms of the, you know, eco, um, environment that we would have. And so that's the way I thought um, about my portfolio life as well, which is why I'm with Insight Partners. They are the best in the business um, and a partner of T200, which I love, um, that, they, uh, that they are the best in the business at looking at portfolios of technology companies, cyber companies, data companies, AI companies, just an, an amazing, amazing array of areas of technology innovation. And although venture capital is not one that I have, uh, that I feel that I have personally got good instincts around, um, I still think that they are a part, an important part of the ecosystem, especially in the world of AI and generative AI, the way things are uh, moving uh, at speed in venture 
And if I'm going to care about lifting women um, into positions of influence, why wouldn't I also in the ecosystem think about women founders? And and most likely they're going to be found in the venture capital world. So that's the way I thought about it. I'm an advisor at Google. I'm a senior advisor at Insight Partners. I do advisory boards of companies that are just out of venture capital into uh into scale up and I'm on I'm on public uh, boards that are part of a really important thought process on uh, on ecosystem like automation um, or AI infrastructure. So that that I think is it was the most natural way for me to transition from the thought leadership mindset that I had when I was operating into this part of the world and not feel like I was going to have to do something totally different. Remember, Cat 2.0 is still Cat. Um, and, uh, it felt, it helped me feel like I was still in my own skin. I was not going to lose relevance. I was not going to suddenly, um, you know, do something that was out of character for me, which was very, very important in my transition. It was a very big reason why I failed the first time I tried it. And I, I tell people all the time, be really clear about who you are, what what makes you tick, what is your superpower and all of that, so that you keep that when you put together your portfolio world. Otherwise, you will either be bored or you will not like the pieces that are there and you will lose your um, energy and what made you great, what made you great in your operating career. So that's my how. One thought that occurs to me as I listen to Karen Ann, and I think about how she and I approached our portfolio lives similarly but differently, is there's this Simon Sinek moment where it starts with why. And so often when I'm talking to people about this, they they focus on the what. So we have to back way up and say, why do you want to do the things you want to do? And that that really does help to then set the stage for what you end up doing and how you go about it. Yeah, the why, and you know, you both kind of spoken to you know energy, joy. Those those things are okay, right? We can we can expect those things that next chapter. And do you want you you talked about insight a couple of times? You want to give Emmett a shout out, uh, Karen? Any? Pretty- oh, em- Emmett, amazing! Emmett's thought leadership uh, with the insight team on ignite, which actually infused a lot of. CIOs, CXOs into the scale up process so that they could learn from the inside while you're still working as an operator, how that world worked has resulted in many of those operators going on to uh, board positions or advisory board opportunities in the insight portfolio. And, and Emmett is the quintessential um, relationship management with a purpose of how to actually get people to relate together in in really strong emotional bonds of experiences and cohorts. And I love working with Insight and Emmett around the uh, Enterprise Technology Exchange, the ETF, which is cohorts of CIOs. It keeps me relevant, even though I'm post my operating career and doing that. And let me tell you, there are lots of opportunities when you think about making that move to keep in the mix of everything that's happening with knowledge, which you'll invariably need in the advisory work or in the board work to have. That is a very important bridge that you've got to build post your operating career is staying relevant. And you cannot do it by reading. You've got to be in the mix with the real practitioners who are doing that. And everybody builds their bridge in a different way. I do that with insight. Yeah, so true. And I'm glad you gave him a shout out. And, you know, also Diana uh, Coco, Coco Brown, she's so, so good. Such a thought leader, helping so many people in creative ways and a big, big fan of hers, too. And, you know, there's someone else who's a a fan of yours, Diana, our first mystery questioner. So I want to tee this up. And, you know, you mentioned networking earlier. And I think her question is going to really help you kind of double click on what you refer to as real networking. So, Listen in, tell us who this is, and then have some fun with the question. Diana, you have for years now modeled the ability to consume conversations with such intentionality and utter presence and use that dialogue to help build connections with a lot of us, to help us solve 
problems that we've had at that moment in time. How do you go about taking what seems to be a very personal problem and finding always a path for a connection that can help us unpack it? So is this Sal? That is indeed. Yeah. Yes. yes. Awesome. Awesome. Sal Campania, Chief Digital and Information Officer at Cushman and Wakefield. I actually met Sal when I very first started as the CIO at Workday, when her boss, Adam Stanley, said, this is the woman I am developing to be my successor. And lo and behold, it came true. Um, but but it, was, it was through, um, I, I, I would say the networking element for me wasn't something I was great at early in my career. I kind of go back to that first half, second half of your career. It started to happen for me in the second half of my career. And I actually had the opportunity to meet Keith Ferrazzi, who wrote the book, Never Read Alone, literally wrote the book on networking. And if you've ever had an opportunity to read the book or read a uh, PDF summary of the book, you know, Keith does a really nice job of of creating a uh, an appreciation for networking that isn't about the Rolodex and how many people can you have uh, connections with on LinkedIn. It's about the relationship that you develop with these people. It's about being vulnerable and it's about recognizing that we were born with two ears and one mouth and having some some presence to be authentically listening to what you're hearing the other person say often creates the opportunity for you to find connections. I also learned um, as I started to explore more this notion of building my personal and professional network that so much of where the great leaps came from were from people I never thought I'd have anything in common with. I'd be like, oh yeah, I'll take that call, but I really don't think, in my mind, I really don't think much is gonna come out of that. And before I know it, this person's causing me to completely rethink everything I know and opportunities that I might never have considered before. And I would say the last technique that I learned, and this from Keith, he hosts these dinners on Friday nights He brings in a gourmet chef, brings together a group of seven or eight people at his home up in the Hollywood Hills overlooking downtown LA and starts the conversation off. We all don't know each other. He knows us with a check-in. And the check-in is a five-minute process uh, for each person where you talk about what's going on for you personally and what's going on for you professionally, very intentionally. Keith always kicked it off, always being very vulnerable. So this wasn't the place for you to brag about your last CIO award or your Academy Award or whatever it might be. And what I learned from that is it completely opens up the relationship with the group of people that are present. So we tried it with our Silicon Valley Women's CIO Network, which when we formed it, we had seven women, now has 60 women, and we do check-ins at every single gathering. And I would tell you, those relationships went from acquaintance to camaraderie to friendships to love. And we've been using the same thing with the T200 board. I use it with my World 50 Network. And I would say, What you get to when you get to a depth of relationship where you're willing to be vulnerable is the opportunity to listen and learn and figure out where you can make a broader impact and how you might be able to introduce people that you meet to other people that can further advance their careers. And it gives you a tool set that you can then use when someone comes to you for help where you have enough pattern recognition that you can say, this looks a little bit like what this other person experienced Maybe you try this. It's amazing. Can you those uh, those four stages? Can you can you share those four stages again that you go through? You, everyone shows up. They're being vulnerable. It's a real check in. It's not. Hey, I'm great. Uh, what, what are those stages again? Yeah. So it's two minutes of, or excuse me, five minutes. Sometimes it's seven. <laughs> sometimes it's two. But it's what's going on for you personally, and what's going on for you professionally. And you just pick the one thing. But again, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. Um, and and the it, it draws the group together. And oftentimes after the conversation is when the help comes in. Like I have someone 
I want to introduce you to who I think can help you with that problem. Or I've been there, you know, my spouse has had cancer. Let me, t- we should talk, right? So it's that kind of connection that it starts to um, manifest. And then you get to know people so much more deeply than you might otherwise. Yeah, and listen to find connection. That's that's amazing, right? People listen to respond typically. Like I'm, I'm figuring out what I'm going to say back to you versus, yeah, to connect. You know, Karen, you've got some great perspectives here too, and you talk about some of these things in terms of this is a, more of a chess, a chess game than a checkers game. Yeah, you know, I um, I have a very orthogonal personality myself, which is a you know just a nicer way of saying I'm weird. And um, I usually am very, very interested in people who are very different than me. I don't find myself, I find myself very curious about people and listening to them um, and not just hanging around the exact same types of people. And, and I built a lot, I build a lot of relationships that way, which is really trying to elicit from people um, the difference and the thing that makes them unique, which I think is the most fascinating thing of people, what is your snowflake, je ne sais quoi, what is it that makes you incredibly special? And so in a, a lot of the relationships that I build, I, I like very, very diverse groups of people that gather together that I have a chance to interact, uh, that I have a chance to interact with. And um, especially people that have a self-awareness of what it is that makes them special. I, I always think of part of my superpower is that I can sit and talk with you for five minutes and I might know things that make you special about yourself that you haven't actually espoused and recognized. And I think that that's much more playing a chess game of how things move, not in the same direction. All the pieces don't move in the same linear direction where everything is expected. Things are going to move across the board and can result from one moment to the next in a change in the game board and the game situation. And I I think of that, um, it can be very frustrating for people that know me, um, but those people that know me a long time know that uh, that kind of way of of interacting with people just fits uh, who I am. I, I will tell you, you find the farthest extent of people who are different. And and as you may or may not know, Dan, I'm Canadian. And the thing that I deeply love about America is the advanced citizenry thinking where you can sit and listen to people who will espouse things that that I will spend my life um, fighting against. But if you can do that in a really civil fashion, people who are not at all the same as you and have the same thoughts, um, there, there's just something that is really, really important um, about those types of relationships and the way that they're born. I, I love uh, what I picked up from Diana there, which is give people space and time in order to express themselves personally and professionally. Um, that is that is a great, great addition to find people who are not the same as you and do it purposefully. That's what I do. I think uh, the Tech Whispers audience is getting a sense of what makes you both so special because everyone just loves loves the two of you, respects the two of you uh, so much. I'd be doing a great disservice if I didn't unpack some of those leadership superpowers. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to start, Karen, with a mystery questioner for you, someone who knows you well. And uh, listen in and let's have some fun with this question that I want to just kind of unpack more of your, your leadership style. So check that out. Hi, Karen Ann. You certainly had an awesome operating career. As you now have transitioned out of your operating career into chapter two, I was curious to know what is the superpower that you had in your operating career that you now leverage in your post operating career to be successful in chapter two? That is Kirk Ball, who's the CIO retired. Uh, giant eagle and also the former CTO of Kroger, a great friend of mine. And he has a fantastic curiosity about what makes people um, tick, 
and what makes them special. And and I I do as well around superpowers. I um uh, I used to think that I was really a great engineer. And uh, I, I said that one day to somebody that I highly respected, uh, who was a boss. I said, you know, what makes me special is I'm a great engineer. And he's like, mm, mm, no, I mean, you're, you're fine. You're good. But that's not what makes you special. And it set me on this journey, really trying to figure out what it is that is my superpower, my je ne sais quoi. It makes me different in the world. And, you know, I, I had worked in four different geographies across the world. I had been electrical engineer in manufacturing, had worked in technology. I had, uh, I had also worked in the automotive business, in the pharmaceutical business, and in the retail business. And I was just feeding into the giant superpower of CAT a whole set of models and patterns because I am a consumer of patterns and a pattern matcher. And that is the extraordinary thing that's me. I, I have a very direct voice um, and courageous voice about using patterns that are in different businesses and in different geographies in order to answer questions that are relevant for today. But that I speak in analogies uh, you you know, the chess versus checkers. I, I like the analogy side of things. And that is that is the extraordinary thing. It, it's why so many people seek me out uh, to ask me questions about themselves and their careers, because I, I'm slightly empathetic as a person, but I'm very fascinated by what makes them tick. And so I'm always pushing them towards understanding their superpower because in embracing your superpower, you will embrace your maximum potential. It is what you were put in this world for, whether you're using it personally or professionally. So, uh, and Kirk and I are, uh, are both uh, collaborators on that, on that topic. Great question, Kirk. Thanks for, for joining us. And uh, Kirk, Kirk and I did a, a podcast in 2023 that was just phenomenal. So he's great experience, big heart, really cares about people like as well. And and Karen, when you say engineer, it makes me think Boilermaker. Does that mean anything to you at all? I am a uh, Boiler Up lover. Diana is too. Uh, we're I both uh, Purdue graduates. And with this NCAA time and Purdue being uh, very high up in the rankings, I am uh, I am just a gigantic uh, optimist that they will make it to the final four and maybe beyond this year in basketball. But yeah, I am I am a giant Boiler fan. Something told me that might be the case, but th thank you for having fun with that, uh, Diana. I've got a, a mystery questioner from you uh, for you and uh, someone who knows you very very well. So let's listen in and uh, you'll have some fun with this one. Hi, Diana. Can you share an example of a challenging situation or period of adversity where your leadership skills were instrumental in bringing about positive outcomes for both the team and the organization? And what impact did that have on your leadership philosophy? Oh, my gosh, that's Rocco. Otherwise, Chris Nardecchia, CIO of Rockwell Automation. So uh, Rocco was the uh, nickname his mom gave him when he was one of six kids. <laughs> and he made the mistake of telling me that once around our leadership team table. So, yeah, Rick, uh, Chris was a, a former direct report of mine and quite honestly, helped me truly appreciate the value of the advice we all get as leaders to hire people that are better and smarter than we are. He was, he is, and I'm incredibly proud of how his career has continued to flourish post his, uh, his time at Amgen. This, this question, it, it just somewhat harkens back to the superpower question as well. Uh, Karen Ann just answered, you know, there was a period in my life where in the first half, um, good to great was my was my be all end all penultimate, you know, leadership book. And this notion of achieving level five leader status. But getting to level five leader wasn't easy. And a lot of people didn't really understand what you meant when you said level five leader. And I always thought servant leadership was an element of that, that 
that I would use to define myself, but it never felt crisp and outcomes focused enough. So Chris and I were both embroiled in what I consider the leadership challenge of my lifetime. We had taken on a major infrastructure outsourcing of 27 services globally at a time when outsourcing was all the rage um, in many industries. We'd gotten in late and we had a woefully under-resourced third-party team and we spent 18 months battling, quite frankly, for what felt like our lives to make this agreement work. Um, a friend of mine recommended a book to me during this time, and it's titled um, Not a Good Day to Die, <laughs> The Truth About Operation Anaconda. So it was a, a uh, battle that took place in, it took place in, in Afghanistan in 2003. And the, it was a historical novel about that battle. And I actually ended up meeting uh, the Delta Force Special Operations leader that led that battle. And he said to me, Diana, my mantra was mission men and me. And it clicked. This notion of you got to put the mission first. It's job one. The men and women I've got to make sure my team has all of the resources and all of the support they need to be successful accomplishing the mission. And I, as the leader, must come last. And in this particular situation, it was not politically acceptable to admit that we'd arrived at a point where we needed to unwind this agreement. Honestly, would have been in the best interest for our company and for the third party. And there was a point after reading that book that I realized I had to put the company my team first and speak truth to power and help them understand how this was never going to turn itself around. And the only way out was to unwind the agreement. I thought I would lose my job. Chris was on my team at the time. He was, he was part of supporting this uh, truth to power uh, movement. What ultimately happened is we didn't lose our jobs. We got support to unwind the agreement. I eventually arose to be the CIO of the company, and we spent the next five years, first two, digging out, and the next three, trying to build on top of that. Um, and I learned a lot about courageous leadership. I learned a lot about what order of priority leaders need to, to place the mission and their people in, and it's something that has stayed with me ever since. Yeah, incredible leadership lessons there, right? I'm going to go get that book, and and uh, so good. I, I, I don't think I told either of you before, but my son was Army Ranger in Afghanistan, so can relate to those stories and that courage. And and uh, but no, what you and Chris did there and your team, I know, is just just incredibly courageous. And thanks again to Chris; he's just such a a great leader. He and I did a leadership masterclass together at the CI 100 Awards a couple of years ago. We did a podcast with he and Kim McEnroth. So um, he gives you all the credit though, Diana. So uh, it's right back at him. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. I've got one more mystery question. I'd love to have both of you respond to it. Maybe Diana, you can go first and then uh, Karen, I'd love to get your perspective too. So let's listen to a mystery question number four. When a CIO joins the board, there is an expectation on how we can potentially shape the digital value of the company. Well, you are potentially the one most important digital expert on your board. So how do you determine if the board is upskilling itself enough on the right topic to be the custodian of value and sufficient conscience of the executive team? How do you help the board in this regard? And how is this different when you were in the corporate world? So that is my friend, dear friend, Sue Jean Lin. Uh, Sue Jean is the Chief Digital and Transformation Officer. I believe that's her title at Alcon. But Sue Jean and I have known each other since 2010, 2000, actually even before that, I think. Um, she was CIO at Allergan, just south of us when I was at Amgen. And we've, we've stayed friends for a very long time. She's also the treasurer of T200. And she's on the board of Arcutus, a therapeutics company, and she serves as their audit committee chair. So she actually would know the answer to this question 
because I did some consulting for Arcutus and helped them find their chief digital officer and hire Sujin to their board as they were trying to address this very issue. Um, and so I, I, the way I would approach it or the way I have approached it, it is, I think the first thing we have to do when we're engaging as board members who bring this tech acumen, this tech operations acumen, is not to assume we're the only ones on the board with it. We may be the only technology operator, but it's likely there are other leaders on the board that have had some exposure or some engagement in sort of technical and digital transformation. So the first thing I think we have to do is to make sure we get to know all of the board members really well, understand their background, understand all the other boards on which they serve, because it might be surprising to see that they're on the boards of highly technical companies, to appreciate then what they hope you'll bring to the board in addition to what might already exist. The CEO will have a perspective. The CEO's executive team will have a perspective, both from the pers from their own technical acumen and what additional investments they'd like to make. And lastly, there's somebody leading the technical function in the company, very important to get their perspective as well. And I think once we understand that full breadth of the picture from that audience, we can then say, okay, what exactly is it that I need to bring that quite frankly is table stakes because I'm being I'm being recruited as the technical a technical person for this board but recognizing that that's not all. Like in reality, you have to be a fulsome board member, not just the tech voice. I think an example that I would share, one of the boards that I joined, there are quite a few members around the table who have had experience leading digital transformation as CEOs in their prior life or are on the boards of highly technical companies. But, you know, we started to engage in this um, heightening of the threat level around cybersecurity. And the the, the phrase zero day kept coming up over and over again. And one of my brilliant financial counterparts, who it, the guy knows everything there is to know about finance, um, said, you know, I just am not sure I get this zero day thing. And I'd um, come across a book that was titled, I believe this is, they, they tell me this is how the world ends by Nicole Pearl Roth. Fabulous, fabulous book on cybersecurity for boards board members to read. And I said, I think I think you will enjoy reading this book because she wrote it, it from a layman's perspective, told a really great story going all the way back to decoding Enigma um, and does a great job of, um, of helping everyone understand what a zero day is. And after he read that book, he asked every member of the board to read the book, right? And the, and the idea there is there was a point in time where you could make a contribution and that ended up becoming something that benefited everyone on the board. It's not always going to work out quite like that, um, but I would say that's an example of you know how you can you can fill that gap. The the question Sujin asked about how is that different when you join a board than how it is when you're interacting with the board as the CXO inside your company. I actually don't think it's quite different at all. I think as the CXO inside your company responsible for tech. You still have to understand who your audience is, study every single board member, understand what they're hearing from their other boards, understand what your CEO and what the executive team, how they show up around techno technology acumen at the board and understand what the board wants from you. The one primary difference is you're operating and managing and the board is obviously overseeing and counseling. But aside from those uh, those two differences, I think it's really all quite similar. Yeah, I uh, the concept, which I, I first of all, Diana, fantastic, taking notes myself on that. The um, the concept of reverse mentoring that I found so incredibly powerful during my operating career, where you you find experts in one area who can help leaders uh, in another area. And the reciprocality that was returned associated with that um, is something um, that I, I personally think that is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and I have got to give full credit to um, Kim Hammonds, uh, God rest her, because uh, she's not with us anymore, but to Kim Hammonds, who really taught me that 
uh, after she joined the Zoom board, which is in what you know about enterprise technology and how enterprise technology buyers work and how your board members think it should work, act and think like a reverse mentor because they are experts in huge topics that are going to be uh, valuable for you and your own curiosity on all of that. And so rather than taking on the, I am going to teach, it is, uh, I, I'm going to kind of help reverse mentor because you're sitting on boards with CEOs. Um, and, and the other small thing that I would add is I had a very romanticized view of what the knowledge set of investors was. I thought, oh, they're investing in all these big companies. They understand the technology behind it. And, and, and my, um, my expectation of somebody who's in the investor community in some way, shape or form, just, you know, oozed sideways into, you know, their expertise. And so I, that is not true. Um, what I have found in the humility of working with investors post-career is they are looking for um, expertise, not so that they can say, oh, thank goodness, that person is the expert, go handle that. But somebody who can actually walk that into the boardroom with their expertise uh, and help the entire team um, understand, whether it's through um, the language decoding um, that's being used or whether it's through an acceptable private sessioning ahead of the boards to coach CISOs or to coach CTOs or CIOs on how to be most effective in their communication in the boardroom. Um, because bringing people up to speed on the digital side of things can feel, for people who are already board members, um, feel either condescending um, or can feel um, intimidating. And you do not in a boardroom need any condescending or intimidating going on at all because of language or uh, or those types of things. So I, I, I just give full credit back to Kim, um, rest in peace. And uh, she had some great advice that I had used myself on that digital journey inside of uh, boardrooms. Well, thank you for paying that forward, and and uh, thanks to Sue Jean. She, uh, when I asked her to do the question, she was so excited to do it. She was traveling globally like nonstop for weeks, and I think this question was recorded. I didn't even want to know what time of day or night in an airport, and so she, thank you so much for that. She'll be very pleased that the T two hundred is the recipient of the uh, the scholarship too. So she will. She good, will. good stuff. Well, I want to take us out with one last question, and. You know, Kirk Ball says, uh, you know, in this chapter, how fast can you experience JOMO, right? The joy of missing out. And so I just want to have, maybe just have you talk about, does life live, you know, we all like a movie that ends with, and they all lived happily ever after. So do we have that to look forward to? Maybe you can start us off, Karen Ann. Yeah, the um, present happiness and joy that you feel in the in the moment when you actually, you don't think about how am I doing and what's going to happen if you actually just look at your present. Um, I find that if I optimize around joy, I believe massively in joy. It goes beyond happiness. It's an enduring feeling that, uh, that helps. If there isn't joy in the things that you're doing, Every single thing in this phase of life is within your hands to make different decisions about. Might not have been in your operating career possible to figure out who your boss was and those types of things. But here it is completely within your hands. You can make a different decision tomorrow. That is where I am right now is that I just embrace that kind of uh, power and control that I have over my environment. And I do feel joy. And there is joy in missing out in the big operating side of the world. Superb. Well, you wouldn't have the flexibility of being in Tampa today, visiting uh, Indianapolis, catching some uh, March Madness. And so good for you. That's fantastic. So, so Diana, how, how do you think about that? Is there uh, is it happily ever after? Uh, I, I completely agree with Karen. Ann. I, I find the freedom of being able to choose what I want to do and who I want to do it with as being a huge source of joy. It doesn't mean that I'm not crazy busy, busier some days that I feel like I was in my operating role. 
But in operating roles, you don't get to choose either of those things in the most part, uh, from the most part. And I just wonder if there's a way to come up with an acronym that's the joy of selecting out, JOSO, which is I select the things I want to do. And I don't select the things I don't want to do. And it allows us to put together these amazing portfolios um, that include some balance, which is wonderful. Incredible. Well, thank you both. Yeah. You know, we've just gotten a little glimpse into Diana McKenzie 2.0, Kat 2.0, uh, amazing conversation, just nuggets, snowflakes, as you call them, Karen Ann, just so many great nuggets there, book recommendations and the good news is everyone knows that we will continue the conversation. And next week on CI.com, we're going to have an article together. And one of the questions I'm dying to ask you, I didn't have time for it today, but uh, you know, if you knew, if you knew then what you know now, you know, how would you have led different, you know, in your operating career? So that's just a little little tidbit. But thank you both so much. This was just so much fun and uh, love your stories. Love your hearts and really love what you're doing this next chapter. So best to you both. Thank you, Thanks, Dan. Dan. Thank you, Karen Ann. As Thanks, I choose Diana. you. <laughs> You've been listening to Tech Whispers, inside the playbook of the best digital leaders, a Woolet and Associates podcast. Keep connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you like what you've heard, please rate the show as this helps us connect the world's best digital leaders with those who aspire to learn, grow, and thrive in this amazing profession. Thanks for listening. Until next time.